So our guests today are Neil Stevenson and Nicole Galland, uh, and they've written a book called uh, The Rise and Fall of Dodo. Uh, you may know them from their other books, uh, which I will not attempt to list from memory, but you can look those up. Okay, so Neil and Nicole, take it away. Google those. Um, <clears throat> thanks. 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 So we have a little program that goes for 20, 25 minutes where we're basically just reading some segments from the book, from the early part of the book, that kind of set up the, the storyline a little bit without being too spoilery. Um, and so uh, Nikki's going to begin by reading just the opening few pages, and then I'll do a little bridge and we'll jump ahead uh, about 30 pages. Cool. All right. Diachronical. Preamble, July 1851. My name is Melisande Stokes, and this is my story. I am writing in July 1851, Common Era, or let's face it, Anno Domini, in the guest chamber of a middle-class home in Kensington, London, England. But I am not a native of this place or time. In fact, I am quite desperate to get out of here. But you already knew that, because when I'm done writing this thing, which for reasons that will soon become clear, I'm calling diachronical, I am going to take it to the very discreet private offices of the Fugger Bank, Threadneedle Street, lock it up in a safe deposit box, and hand it over to the most powerful banker in London, who is going to steal it, steal it in a vault, not to be opened for more than 160 years. The fuckers, above all people in this world, understand the dangers of diachronic shear. They know that to open the box and read the document sooner would be to trigger a catastrophe that would wipe London's financial district off the map and leave a smoking crater in its place. Actually, it would be much worse than a smoking crater, but a smoking crater is how history would describe it once the surviving witnesses had been sent off to the madhouse. I'm writing with a steel-nibbed dip, dip pen, model number 137B, from Hughes and Son Limited of Birmingham. I requested the extra fine tip partly to save money on paper, and partly so that I could jab my thumb with it and draw blood. The brown smear across the top of this page can be tested in any 21st century DNA lab. Compare the results to what is on file in my personnel record at Dodo headquarters, and you will know that I am a woman of your era, writing in the middle of the 19th century. I intend to write everything that explains how I came to be here, no matter how far-fetched or hallucinatory it may sound. To quote Peter Gabriel, a singer-songwriter who will be born 99 years from now, this will be my testimony. I do attest that I am here against my will, having been sent here from September 8, 1850, and from the city of San Francisco, California, the day before California was granted statehood. I do attest that I belong in Boston, Massachusetts, in the first quarter of the 21st century. There and then, I am part of the Department of Diachronic Operations, a black budget arm of the United States government that has gone rather badly off the rails due to internal treachery. In the time in which I write this, 1851, magic is waning. The research that Dodo paid me to perform indicates that magic will cease to exist at the end of this month, July 28th. When that happens, I will be trapped here in a post-magic world for the rest of my days. The only way anyone will ever know what became of me is through this deposition. While I have managed to land myself in comfortable, by 1851 standards, quarters, with access to pen, ink, leisure time, and privacy, it has been at the expense of freedom. My hosts would not consider allowing me out of the house alone for an evening constitutional, let alone to seek out witches who might help me. One comment before I begin. If anyone from Dodo ever reads this, for the love of God, please add corset makers to the list of abettors we need to recruit in any Victorian DTAPs. Corsets are intended to be custom made to conform to the actual shape of a lady's body, and it's uncomfortable to have to borrow one or buy one off the rack, although servants and poorer women generally do that, but do not lace them tightly as they must engage in manual labor. Being here entirely on charity, I prefer not to ask my hosts to extend credit for a custom fit one, but wearing this one borrowed from my hostess is just awful. It makes a Renaissance bodice feel like a bikini. I'm not even kidding. So she goes on, Mel <clears throat> Melisande goes on to explain how she was working at Harvard University in the 
Department of Ancient Classical Languages as a downtrodden and exploited adjunct faculty member uh, when she met a young man named Tristan who was clearly not from around there in the sense that he was a kind of military ROTC-ish kind of guy. And Tristan um, recruited her for a top secret government job with an entity known as Dodo, which uh, he would not, he, he, he doesn't explain what the initials stand for at first, so she has to keep guessing what it might mean. Um, and the job has to do with translating a trove of miscellaneous ancient documents that Dodo has come into the possession of, uh, and it all has to be done secretly. So they get a space uh, in a building between Harvard and MIT that's kind of a classic startup then just a, a crappy old building where little companies go in and out of existence all the time and they have a space there and they fill it up with these documents and start working on them and um, it becomes clear that every single one of these documents has something or other to do with magic as a real thing that once existed but exists no more. Uh, so we're gonna pick up the action on about page 30 um, after this process has been going on for uh, a few months and they've translated a lot of documents and they have a database built up, but they don't yet fully understand why magic disappeared. And we're just going to do it as a dramatic rendition yeah. uh, because so much of it is uh, um, just a conversation between the two of them. Normally we have scripts like Neil has there, but I left mine in the hotel room. So I'm, I'm gonna improvise trying to remember what I'm supposed to say where. I think it'll be fine. So it starts with Mel. There was never any doubt as to the gist. Some manner of cause and effect relationship existed between the rise of scientific knowledge and the decline of magic. The two could not comfortably coexist. To the extent that the database could be cajoled into spitting out actual numbers, it was clear that magic had declined gradually but steadily, starting in the middle of the 1600s. It was still holding its own in the opening decades of the 1800s, but plunged into a nosedive during the 1830s. From then through the 1840s, magic declined precipitously. As our store of documents, many written by witches themselves, grew to fill a phalanx of used filing cabinets and gun safes that Tristan scored on Craigslist, we were able to track the decline from year to year and then from month to month. These poor women expressed shock at the dwindling of their powers, in some cases mentioning specific spells that had worked a few weeks ago but no longer had effect. As it turns out, in 1851, the year in which I find myself as I scribble these words, all of the world's technologies were brought together for the great exhibition at the newly constructed magnificent Crystal Palace in Hyde Park, London. Tristan's hypothesis therefore held that this coming together, this conscious concentration of technological advancement all in one point of space-time had dampened magic to the point where it fizzled out for good. Like a doused fire, it had no power to rekindle itself once extinguished. The causal relationship between the two eluded us for a time. I suggested that magic's flourishing required people to believe in it, but Tristan dismissed this mentality as belonging more to children's literature than to reality. He was certain there was a mechanical or physical causality, that there was something about the technological worldview or technology itself that somehow jammed the frequencies magic used. We both began to read whatever we could about the great exhibition in the hopes that it might illuminate something. You may notice that I was exceeding by far my responsibilities as a translator. Translating, especially of obscure texts written in extinct tongues, often resembles the solving of a riddle. Here was a riddle to put all others to shame. Tristan's enthusiasm was infectious and I could not divest myself from it. Having no other responsibilities, I became as preoccupied with his project as he was himself. Per Tristan's suggestion, I took out stacks of books from Widener Library. Harvard had not figured out yet that I'd quit. These included tomes on everything from heliography to Queen Victoria's private life to Baruch Spinoza's sexual proclivities to Frederick Bakewell to the Tempest prognosticator to Struhall numbers. I would bring these to Tristan and we would divide our time between perusing them and internet searches. We soon knew more <clears throat> about the great exhibition and its 13,000 odd exhibits than Prince Albert ever did. We knew more about its showcase, the Crystal Palace, than even Joseph Paxton, the gardener who designed the blessed thing. We learned little that was helpful. 
However, one evening in March, as I sat on the consignment store couch I'd insisted on bringing in to spruce up the place, and Tristan lolled on the rug beside a low table with a beer, each of us bleary-eyed from reading, I encountered a passage in an obscure booklet entitled Arresting and Alluring Astronomical Anecdotes, published in 1897. Here I learned that while the Great Exhibition of 1851 was in process, it lasted for several months, an event of relative interest occurred elsewhere in Europe, to be precise, in Königsberg, Prussia. For the first time in history, a solar eclipse was successfully photographed. I read this statement aloud. It set Tristan on fire with excitement. He had already suspected that photography in particular of all technological developments was the likeliest to have somehow impeded magic. Now, somehow, he was certain. It took me a while to calm him down to the point where he could explain himself. I'll be honest with you, as a physicist, I'm a hack. I majored in it, yes, but I was never employed in that capacity. But if you cut me, I still bleed physicist blood. I'll go to my grave believing that if magic existed, there's a scientific explanation for it. That sounds like a contradiction to me, since our whole working hypothesis is that science broke it somehow. Work with me here. <clears throat> Have you ever heard of the many worlds interpretation of quantum mechanics? Only in cocktail party discourse that would make you roll your eyes and heave deep sighs. Well, there are certain experiments where the results only make sense if the system that's being observed actually exists in more than one state until the moment when the scientist makes the observation. Is this Schrodinger's cat? Because even I have heard of that. Well, that's the classic example. It's just a thought experiment, by the way. No one ever actually did it. That's good. Peter would be all over them. Do you know what it is? You put a cat in a sealed box. There's a device inside of the box that's capable of killing the cat by breaking open a vial of poison gas or something. That device is triggered by some random event generator, like a sample of some radioactive material that either decays, producing a bit of radiation, or doesn't. You close the lid, the cat and the poison gas and the radioactive sample become a sealed system. You cannot predict or know what has happened. You don't know if the cat is alive or dead. It's not just that you don't, you can't. There's literally no way of knowing. Now, in a classical physics way of thinking, it's either one or the other. The cat is either alive or dead for real. You just don't happen to know which. But in a quantum physics way of thinking, the cat really is both alive and dead. It exists in two mutually incompatible states at the same time. Not until you open the lid and look inside does the wave function collapse. Whoa, whoa, you had me until the very end. When did we start talking about, what did you call it, a wave function? And how does that, whatever it is, collapse? My bad, it's just physicist lingo for what I was saying. If you were to express the Schrodinger's cat experiment mathematically, you'd write down an equation that's called a wave function. That function has multiple terms that are superimposed. It's not just one thing. Multiple terms? Yeah, a term here means a fragment of math. It is to an equation what a phrase is to a sentence. So you're saying there's one term for cat is alive and another for cat is dead. Is that what you mean in this usage? Yes, O oh linguist. And when you say they're superimposed? Mathematically, it just means that they're sort of added to each other to make a combined picture of the system. Until it collapses or whatever. Multiple terms superimposed is a quantum thing. It's the essence of quantum mechanics. But there's this interesting fact, which is that that kind of math only works. It only provides an accurate description of the system until you open the lid and look inside. At that point, you see a live cat or a dead cat, period. It has become a classical system. Department of Deadly Observations? He rolled his eyes. Anyway, that's what you mean by the collapse of the wave function. Yeah, it's just physicists speak for the thing that happens when all of the superimposed terms, the descriptions of different possible realities, resolve into a single classical outcome that our brains can understand. Our scientific rational brains, you mean. A look of mild satisfaction came onto his face. Exactly. But now we've circled back to my theory. Which theory is that? The one that belongs more to children's literature than to reality, remember? Oh yeah, people have to believe in magic. Yes. That's not exactly what I'm saying. Yes, human consciousness is in the loop, but hear me out. If you buy the many worlds interpretation of quantum mechanics, it means that all possible outcomes are really happening somewhere. There's one world with a live cat and another with a dead cat. Exactly, no kidding. Complete, fully independent realities that are the same, except that in one of them the cat's dead 
and then the other, it's alive. And the quantum superposition, that just means that the scientist standing there with his hand on the lid of the box is at a fork in the road. Both paths, both worlds are open to him. He could shunt into one or the other. And when he hauls the lid open, the decision gets made. He's now in one world or the other, and there's no going back. Okay, I said. Not in the sense of I agree with you, but in the sense of I'm paying attention. The scientist can't control which path he or she takes. I saw that he was trolling me, waiting for me to pick up the bait. No, it was more than that. He wanted me to mention a possibility that he could think about but never say out loud because he was all Mr. Science. So I did. Let's switch it up a little then, I said, and swap out the white lab coat and the clipboard for, I don't know, a pointy black hat and a broom and lose a pronoun if she did somehow have the ability to choose which world she was going to be shunted to when she opened the lid, if she could control the outcome. It would look like magic. What do you mean look like? It would be magic. Just saying that it's about choosing possible outcomes that already exist, slipstreaming between closely related alternate realities as opposed to bringing those realities into existence. But that's a distinction without a difference. As far as normal observers are concerned, people who haven't studied quantum physics, sure. Put it however you like, a witch may summon the desired effect from a parallel slash simultaneous reality. Thus the historical references of witch's magic as summoning, that is quite literally what they were doing. My hypothesis. Tristan said, pronouncing the word with exaggerated care since he had a few beers in him. Is that photography disables this summoning as you called it. Photography breaks magic by embalming a specific moment, one version of reality into a recorded image. Once that moment is so recorded, then all other possible versions of that moment are excluded from the world that contains that photograph. I get it. There's no wiggle room left in which to function magically. He nodded. He seemed relieved to have got all of this off his chest and that I hadn't laughed him out of the room. You've been thinking about this for a while, I said. He nodded. But it wasn't until we saw the daguerreotype of the solar eclipse that the penny dropped. That's right. That was only about the bazillionth daguerreotype ever made. People had been taking photographs for 16 years by that point. What's so special about that one? The scope of it, I think. The number of minds and worlds affected. If I'm Louis Daguerre screwing around in my lab in Paris, taking pictures of whatever's handy, then I've collapsed the waveform, yes, but only in as much as it encompasses my brain and a few little objects in my lab. If I show the daguerreotype to my wife or my friend, then the effect spreads to them as well. And we can guess that witches who live in the neighborhood might sense a dampening of their magical abilities without understanding why. But the total eclipse of the sun on July 28, 1851, was probably witnessed by more human beings than any other event in the history of the world up to that point. Of course, everyone in Europe could see it. Just by looking up into the sky, hundreds of millions of people, Mel, that event captured more eyeballs at the same moment than any Beyonce video on YouTube. And to the extent that it was frozen and bombed on a daguerreotype, well... If previous uses of photography had dampened magic, then this was like dumping the Atlantic Ocean on it. When the shutter opened to capture that first perfect image of the eclipse, magic ceased to function across all human societies. We back-checked the dates of all documents from 1851. Indeed, there were three from the first half of the year, two English, one Italian. There was a fragment of one in late July, Hungarian. There were none after July 28th, the date of the eclipse. None. That's it. Muttered Tristan, preoccupied, getting to his feet. He rested his hands on his desk and stared absently at the wall. Yes, I said. I felt deflated. Although he'd never told me why Dodo was so interested in understanding magic, common sense screamed it was because they wanted to be able to do it. Department of doing the occult? Which clearly could never happen. There's no getting rid of photography, so there's no bringing magic back. Tristan froze and after a beat jerked his head in my direction. You're right. That's it. Where there is no photography, there could still be magic. That's not quite what I said. He began to pace the office. We had made it somewhat larger by knocking out walls that separated it from adjoining spaces, but this still required following a figure eight-ish path between piles of books, artifacts, freestanding gun safes, to be recycled beer bottles, and still unexplained high-tech military gear. How do we get rid of photography? We cannot get rid of photography. No, it's definitely possible. 
I just have to figure out how it's done. What do you mean, how it's done? I'm not seeing something. What am I missing? You're missing the part where photography became ubiquitous and all magic went away forever? He turned to look at me, his eyes focused now and bright. No, it's not a lost cause. That was not the tone of hypothesis or theory. That was the tone of either faith or knowledge. I felt a shiver run down my spine. I realize there are a lot of things you can't tell me, but whatever it specifically is you're not telling me at this precise moment, fucking tell me. Otherwise, I'm useless. His gaze went fuzzy again as he engaged in some brief mental soliloquy. Then he nodded. I can't tell you much, but I can tell you that we know it's possible. We? Dodo. There's evidence. That's all I can say. Okay. So that's the end of the reading. <laughs> Thanks. So that's kind of the setup uh, for the story. That's all the first 30 or and so. And then there's still all that. That's, yeah. 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 So um, this is the point where we normally jump over to question and answer time. So uh, I believe we have some kind of bouncing cube that is going to be used uh, <laughs> to facilitate that. Oh, thanks for turning up the lights. Well, there's quite a sort of empty band in the middle of the room there. We've definitely got the back of the if bus. If this was before. a folk concert, we would encourage you all to move down to the front. Fortunately, it's not a folk <laughs> Yeah. Um. Uh, so we have this throwable mic, which you've probably seen if you've been to any of these events in the last month or so. so does anyone so have a question? Cool. Right. So, so now I know, I guess, why Google sold off our satellite business. <laughs> Street View is next, I guess. Um, so how do you guys collaborate on a book like this? Did you work together? Do you do it remotely? Do you do a chapter at a time? So we keep saying that we need to fabricate a bunch of stories about all the drama and tension that existed and made it such a, a thrill-charged collaboration, but it was pretty calm, professional. There was the idea, which start, came from an idea I came up with, and we developed it to a certain point where we kind of knew who the characters were. We had a sense of what kind of people they were and the overall arc of the story, and then Nikki kind of would break trail for the most part. I would play around with it, and then when I felt like I had gotten it as far as I could, I'd pass it back to Neil. Neil would tweak it. There were some things, especially like the section you just read, which is there's a lot of quantum theory there, which Neil's a little more comfortable than I am. So he, he broke ground on those parts of that and, um, and then would send it to me. So it really was, it was very intuitive. It just seemed very obvious to both of us who was better prepared in terms of schedule and expertise, um, or even just the kind of voice we were creating. Uh, so whoever it, whoever it made sense to start would start, and then the other person would do pickup. So we both ended up, our fingerprints are all over the whole thing, both of our fingerprints, but it, 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 was, really, it was very intuitive. Actually, that's a lie. He kept me locked in his basement and would feed me <laughs> chocolate whenever I finished a chapter. It's, uh, it's an epistolary book, so it's uh, written as a series of documents that were allegedly uh, extracted from an archive that was stolen from this organization. So um, the, what you've been hearing is a, a little bit anomalous in that it's sort of extended narrative written by one voice, but there's big sections of the book that are in the form of text message exchanges or transcripts or email threads or Slack messages or uh, PowerPoint presentations, kind of the whole bureaucratic communication apparatus ends up sort of making an appearance in this book. Um, hello? Oh. Uh, besides the how, uh, why? why? What made two of you think that this was a book that really needed somebody else's voice, somebody else's uh, input? Well, we had worked together previously on uh, uh, another uh, so sort of big collaborative project called the Mongoliad. So we kind of uh, had a sense uh, that it could work. And um, this just, uh, I mean, the, the original idea kind of came to me, as I said, but as I started thinking about what would be entailed in actually making it into a novel, it just seemed to me like a completely obvious uh, opportunity to uh, collaborate with Nikki again, since her Metier is uh, writing um, 
uh, well-researched historical novels. He twisted my arm and I said yes. <laughs> So uh, I don't want to give any spoilers, but I'm seeing some uh, relationship to Anathem in this. I won't, I won't say what. Um, without giving it away, should we be keeping our eye open for any uh, Easter eggs? No, there's none of that stuff, but you're correct about the, the connection. So the, when I was working on Anathem, um, <clears throat> the, um, I got interested in this whole uh, many worlds interpretation of quantum mechanics and learned that there's a branch of, of metaphysics, so there are still people who do metaphysics for a living, uh, it turns out, and some of them think about alternate worlds or possible worlds in a very serious way, like with logical formalism, and, uh, and so, um, so it's a thing, and, um, and uh, it, it stuck with me a little bit, and so you're, I think you're right in seeing that kind of connection, but there's not the other kind of connection that you're thinking of. I have a little anecdote I can add to that, which is the first two times, you're not the first person that's pointed that out, but the first two times someone in the audience asked Neil about that, it, he, like it hadn't occurred to him. It's occurred to him now because yeah. he's been reminded of it enough times. <laughs> Oh, good. It finally went airborne. I've been <laughs> just, yeah. Um, keeping to the theme of connections on to earlier books, any chance Enoch Root is walking around in 1851 in London? And if not, any chance we'll get the final third of Cryptonomicon at some point? <laughs> um, nope. I mean, the, it's, it's, it is not uh, connected to, to my other books. There's no... No Enoch Root in this one, and um, the uh, um, no, it's it's a standalone. I mean, uh, there w there may be there already are other spin-outs of this book, but uh, so uh, we've got a um, struck up a relationship with a startup called Bound. It's uh, GetBound.io, which they're making a an app for reading. Uh, for, for enjoying fiction, um, either by reading it or listening to it. Uh, <clears throat> and they're sort of coming out of a gaming background, so I think they were originally thinking of, of adding narrative content to game worlds, but it was a really good fit for what we wanted to do. And so they launched uh, on Tuesday. Mm -hmm. they're, on the, uh, they're on the App Store. I don't know if they've got an Android app, app up yet. Anyway, the... Um, <coughs> point is that, um, that there are some other writers who've been playing in this world already um, during the last year or so, and, have, and so the Bound is going to be episodically releasing some, um, some of their work, which purports to be other leaked material from the same archive, but it's different characters and different stories. Different narratives, yeah. Yeah, but no Enoch Root. And also different documents. Is, is that going, are the, are the, um are the bureaucratic documents going into the yeah. going into bounds? Yeah, well? the, yeah, the sexual harassment policy is up. I think <laughs> and, uh, the um, a bunch of the the sort of bureaucratic type uh, things are. So I did some of that, and then we had six other writers contribute. So there's a whole lot of literally a lot of different voices involved in that one, and it's expanding gradually through time. Oh, heave it back! Someone someone will catch it. <laughs> no, no. I guess if they were <laughs> um, stylistically, how'd you choose to do bureaucratic documents? That's not a really boring novel style. Or <laughs> well, you've got to. Uh, um, I mean, the, so uh, as I think you can sense, the overall tone of this book is more lighthearted, satirical fun than, than say Seven Eves. Right. Yeah. Um, so, um, um, so the, uh, uh, so it's an opportunity to kind of make fun of that, of, of that stuff. So hopefully in those parts of the, the document that are like PowerPoint presentations, they're uh, sufficiently over the top that, uh, they'll actually be enjoyable to, to read. 
Neil did a lot of the original drafts of those, and when I got them, I was laughing out loud, which normally doesn't happen when I'm reading PowerPoint presentations. <laughs> In front of you. Throw that man a cube. So I think you tried with uh, something similar with Seven Eves, where Seven Eves mm -hmm. was sort of an anchor in a universe around which ancillary projects were mm -hmm. scattered. Um, is that working out well? I mean, you're doing the same thing again, so I assume so. Um, I'm trying to think of uh, the ancillary um, Seven Eves projects. Um, the, uh, I mean, I'm always thinking about it. Uh, I always, it seems like something that ought to work. Um, yeah, I feel like I'm in a good, relatively privileged position to be able to try to make that kind of thing work. So, and then it always turns out to be really hard and writing novels and getting them published turns out to be really easy. Uh, so um, <clears throat> in the case of Seven Eves, there is a film adaptation underway and that seems to be moving along in a promising way, but um, what tends to happen is that um, if something like that gets going, it has a suppressing effect on everything else because why bother trying to work on anything else like a, a game or what have you if there's a possibility that a movie project is going to happen. So it, 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 it causes everything else to be sort of abandoned or put on hold while you wait for the, the next thing to to move. In the case of the Bound collaboration, um, so far that's not happening because the, uh, um, the timing just happened to work out really well that, that they had a startup, they wanted to launch their app at exactly the same time as the book was going to launch. And so um, it's, uh, it's out there. We'll, we'll see how it, uh, how it develops. Uh, Well, sir, sir. Can you just like throw it up in the air yeah, so we can have? Yeah, so <laughs> we were told there was going to be a flying cube. Okay. Well. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks. So, uh, what's the best book you've read in the last year that's not one of your own? The last oh, year. Oh, this man. is one of those deer in headlight questions. I mean, whatever. A book that you read in the last year that you really liked <laughs> doesn't have to be the best. No, it's just this comes up every time, and we every time we say we really should have a prepped yeah. answer <laughs> for this, and then uh, <laughs> it's it's terrible because it's an opportunity to uh, support somebody else's work. And um, oh, see, I finally thought of one. Anna Lee Newitz has one that's coming out. I can't remember the title of it. Um, that's terrible. Um, but if only there was some kind of search engine that could, could find this. Your brain? Yeah. Um, so will be. new it's N-E-W-I-T-Z, first name Annalee, A-N-N-A-L-E-E. -E, and it's, um, uh, I think it's just out. Uh, so, um, so that's uh, worth checking out. It's her first book, so it should be easy to... To, uh, to find on Bing or whatever. I, I, I know what the most interesting thing I've read in the last year is, but I guarantee you it will not be of interest to any of you. So it's, it's the town report for the town of West Tisbury, Massachusetts, uh, which is research for a project I'm working on now, and it's really like... Okay, so why was that so interesting then? Sorry, what? Why, why was that the most interesting thing you've read? Um, because it because it, it fed research that I was trying to do, and it forced me, I grew up in the town of Westersbury, and it forced me to step back and look at my own microcosm as a thing that could be studied as opposed to just a place to live in. Um, so it, it, it made me bend my brain in a new way. But A, I, I'm almost the only person that it would have that effect on, and you guys have probably never even heard of Westersbury, so. Um, So they're going to go get it. <laughs> <laughs> is it like a recent thing? Or is yeah, it's, 27, it's 2016. It's the town report for the town of West Isbury 2016. How long it, is it? It's, it's, about, it's about that thick. Wow. It's like one Neil Stevenson chapter. <laughs> <laughs>
So there's another interesting thing that's happened. It's not, I don't think it was published in the last year, but Matt Ruff, R-U-F-F, -F, has a really interesting book called Lovecraft Country, uh, which um, uh, it's hard to encapsulate the story, but it's a, a brilliant, a weird idea. And uh, just uh, it just was announced a couple of weeks ago that it's going to be a television series. Um, so love, that's worth checking out. You can say that you read the book before it was on TV. Right. Is the Annalee Newitz book autonomous? That sounds right. My, part of my problem is that I, the, they send these things to me to blurb, and sometimes they have different titles. Sure. So I like I blurbed Corey. That's another good one. Corey Doctorow's book, which is now called Walk Away, when I blurbed it, was called Utopia. Um, so, and there's one coming out in um, September uh, by Joe Brassi, um, mm. which who's one of the other Mongoliad writers called Skyfarer, which is just a great fun adventure sci-fi fantasy novel. So. You've been better about reading new stuff than me. I'm, I'm like in hermit mode um, at the moment. Oh, very nice. That made me think, um, what genres do you both read for both inspiration and fun? I read, I, I read a huge range. When I'm, when I'm working on a story with a particular tone, I often try to stay close to other books that are in that tone just so that my inner voice, I tend to walk around thinking in the voice of whatever I'm reading. So I, I try to keep the voice fairly consistent when I'm in a certain part of my process, but then when I'm not, I like to go as far afield as I possibly can. So historical, I love historical fiction. Um, I like some sci-fi and fantasy. I'm, I'm, I don't gobble it up in quite the same way. I like contemporary literary fiction and contemporary commercial fiction. And, and I love kids' books. I just like being reminded of being in that headspace. I read a lot of history. Um, surprise, surprise. Um, so, uh, and some books about science. Oh, uh, see, now it's coming to me. Um, Arrival of the Fittest by Andreas Wagner. Really interesting book about science. And it's about the, the, the problem of with, uh, you know, how does, uh, how does evolution actually work on a combinatorial level? You know, just randomly shuffling amino acids around doesn't seem like it would get you anywhere if you look at the, the all of the combinations that would fail. Um, so he's coming at, he work, he's at the Santa Fe Institute, who's done all kinds of really interesting computational work in this area, and has got a really readable book out uh, on that topic that was pretty pretty amazing to read. Cool. I read a lot of plays. I completely forgot that because my background's in theater and I can't really divorce myself from that. That's, yeah. Anyone else? Should we, uh, oops. Okay, yeah, thank you. <laughs> Taking one for the team. Okay, well, I want to see a perfect spiral. Yeah, yeah. yeah. all right. Okay. Now we're talking. <clears throat> All right, uh, so this was not the first book either of you've written. I assume it won't be the last either of you write. Uh, I'm just curious, what are you looking forward to trying differently next time, perhaps? What are our next book projects? Just uh, not necessarily what the, what the plot is, but just what, what, what are you going to try doing differently as you embark on your next projects? I'm a little superstitious about talking about stuff that hasn't been birthed yet. Okay. Yeah, I'm the same way, so uh, I resort to generalities. Um, so um, both of us are working on solo books, so uh, although we had a great time collaborating, that's, that's an unnatural state of affairs, and we're both re reverting to form. Um, so I'm working on one that is um, uh, technically, you could call it a follow-on to Reemd, but it's so different from Reem-D that it's just going to confuse everybody if I describe it that way. But um, so back to more of a contemporary near-term sci-fi kind of 
sensibility. I'm writing something that requires me to read the West Tisbury Town Report. <laughs> Hi, uh, I'm wondering how much influence do you have over the audiobook versions of your works? Do you uh, work with the narrators, or is this just, you know, sometimes I wonder if it's this third party's uh, interpretation of the work that I'm actually getting? Uh, normally, that, normally it is a third party interpretation. In fact, for um, Step Dog, a friend of mine who's in the industry, scolded me that I was sort of trying to indirectly get, get to the actor because we happen to know him a little bit. Um, but in this particular case, uh, that same person is now very happy with me because um, I got her the role of Mel, the, the voice that I was just reading. She is my college roommate who studied linguistics at Harvard, and she is now playing the voice of a person that studied linguistics at Harvard. Um, she's a voiceover artist. I mean, I didn't just pluck her out of nowhere. but So I got to have control over that, which was really fun. And in this particular case, um, there's a few funky things about how Mel writes. She's writing, as she says, with a dip pen in Victorian England. So what I did not include is that there's a few places where, as she's writing, she drops an F-bomb or says something that's very anachronistic, and then she crosses it out and then puts something that's more Victorian because she is clearly going to be stuck there for the rest of her life, so she's trying to make herself think like a Victorian. And so she's, she's correcting herself. And in the audio book, the way that they did that was Laurence would start to say fuck, and then she'd cut herself off. And then they added a little sound bite that was the sound of a, a, of a pen scratching out a word. Uh, so that was, she came up with what she was going to do by talking to me. And then once they heard her, they added the scratchy thing. Oh, nice. nice. Yeah. yeah. No, it's gotten really interesting because it's, it blew up into such a big, important market that a lot of smart people are getting engaged in thinking about how to make the process better. Um, and so um, uh, it's changed my style a little bit because I, I used to put more diagrams and things that you can't read out loud into books, and now I don't do that. Like footnotes, for example, are problematic. You know, like some actors have like their special footnote tone of voice that they'll go into <laughs> to sort of give you a cue that this is a footnote, but it's still really awkward in audio. And I just heard that, um, this might be interesting to you, there's, I can't remember if it's Brilliance or Audible, but one of the big audiobook companies is, is um, trying to, or reach out to, to playwrights and 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 uh, produce more original content that would be more uh, sort of dramatic. Oh, that's interesting. As opposed to just reading a, a prose book that's actually set up like what we used to call a radio play and what is now called yeah. an, an audio drama. Um, so it's a huge market because there's all these people who uh, who like long haul truck drivers or assembly line workers who listen to audio books like, you know, 8, 10, 12 hours a day. And um, so they have an insatiable demand for this stuff. Uh, and um, so all kinds of really interesting things are going on in that space, and it's a, it's a cool space to be in. You just reminded me of something that's only tangentially related. Historically, in Cuba, the cigar rollers used to have professional readers brought over from Europe to read them Tolstoy and things like that. So. It's a, it's a grand old tradition. I'm glad it's continuing. Yeah, the Monte Cristo cigar, which is you know, one of the best, most famous cigars, was named that because in that room, the favorite book of those cigar rollers was The, the Count, Count of, of Monte, Monte Cristo. Cristo. Yeah, yeah. So, thank you. Uh, anyone? Oh, okay, all right. So I assume you guys enjoy writing books, but it's also your job. Um, so how does that kind of play out as a conflict at any time in terms of like when it ceases to be enjoyable and it becomes just a job? I've had just a jobs, and writing is never just a job. Um, it, it's a lot of work sometimes. Sometimes it's really fun. When I wrote my first novel, The Fool's Tale, I, at a certain point I went from having writer's block to being completely obsessed, and I was writing 17 hours a day and couldn't stop. 
like the, the discipline was to stop doing it and do things like eat breakfast or take a shower or sleep. Um, and then there's other times that it, it's like pulling teeth. But neither of those two extremes are how I've ever felt about anything that's like a job where you show up somewhere and have a boss and do your job and then go home. Um, it's a, for, so for me personally, it's, a, it's its own thing. And even though it varies, it's, all of its various faces are set apart from any other kind of work that I ever did before it. You have a different answer because you have a different... Um, yeah, I, I figured out a long time ago that it's best if I get up in the morning, write for a couple of hours, maybe three hours max, and then stop and do something else for the, for the rest of the day. And by something else, I mean something that's totally not writing, something like doing geeky things or building things. Because there's a lot that happens as a background process, and you've got to allow that to happen, or I have to allow that to happen, because if I don't, then when I get up the next day and go back to writing, um, I don't have anything. So um, I just long ago figured out I had to let the mysterious background process do its thing. Um, and then, um, and even you know, doing two, two, even one hour of work a day generates enough material to produce a, a book in a year, two years, easy. So it's not a, you know, it doesn't slow things down uh, to, to take that kind of measured paced approach. But there is this weird thing that's, it's like, um, you know, we used to call it dieseling, where you shut your car off, but it keeps, the engine keeps running for a little while. Um, that happens to me, so when I stop, I have to carry my phone around with me and do voice memos for about 15 minutes uh, because I'll get like lines of dialogue or ideas um, that that are kind of dieseling in my head. That, you know, I've, I've, that are, it's it's usually good stuff, and uh, so I'll make a record of those, and that and then that's where I start the next the next day. So. Uh, so we're almost out of time, uh, so if anyone has a last question. If I can figure out how to phrase it. Uh, this one's specifically for Neil. Um, you've written uh, a lot of pretty uh, well-known books and have a lot of uh, fans. And I'm wondering, uh, out of all those books, which, which ones do you think has, has produced the most rabid fans? The most <laughs> rabid fans? Yeah, you know, which books are most, uh, I don't want to say inspiring, but like... Have, <laughs> um... It's, it, there's different kinds of rabid fans. There's like a taxonomy of rabid fans. Um, so um, I think uh, it seems to me that among female readers, Diamond Age and Snow Crash are both super popular, maybe Diamond Age a little more so. Um, and then um, Cryptonomicon is really pop. It, it's just, it's always a different rabid fan, kind of. Uh, what's that? Yeah, yeah. So, um, and and so, for example, when I published Quicksilver, which is my first kind of straight-up historical novel, um, I went. I did a tour in um, the UK for that, and some guy approached me. A silver-haired guy walked up and said hello, and um, he had become a fan of that book, but he was had no idea I had written anything else, right? So that's just kind of how that, that market works for whatever reason. Um, we have a couple minutes, so I'm gonna ask a follow-up to that, which is, uh, Nicole, you're mostly known for writing historical fiction, um, so this is a little out of genre. Do you find that a lot of your fans uh, are excited for this book or excited for you to do more stuff like this that's kind of comedic or more sci-fi-y? I, I think so. Something that I've been trying to come to terms with is the fact that I'm, I'm, I think I'm a little funnier than I think I am. <laughs> um, I, don't, I don't think of myself as trying to write funny, but that seems to be a lot of the feedback that I'm getting is that's part of what people like about my writing. This is not as out of genre as my last book, which I think we were talking about this before. I wrote one contemporary romantic comedy. It's the last book that I wrote. And it's, this, is, this actually feels like a return to form because, for instance, um, 
we are, uh, we needed a medieval, we needed medieval warfare for a section of this book. And so we chose the Fourth Crusade because I wrote a novel called Crossed, colon, A Tale of the Fourth Crusade. So we were, we were drawing, I actually got to return to a lot of my stuff in, in doing this. Um, Stepdog was the one that just, even, even my editor said, well, that came out of nowhere. Um, so this was, this was sort of like a, a fun, playful return to familiar material, but getting to do it in a whole new way, and that was delightful. I love trying new things, and this was, this was just, just delightful. Do you have Easter egg characters from your previous Fourth Crusade book? Mm, I don't think so. If I do, it, they're buried so deeply that I didn't even mention it to Neil. <laughs> um, now I'm starting to feel like maybe there's some, but it's, I've even buried it from myself. You probably referred so. to important figures like the emperor or whatever who, who was mentioned. Yeah, so there's historical Easter eggs, yeah. so to speak, but not, um, no. No, I don't do that, but maybe I should. People I shall it. start. Okay, I think we're out of time, so thanks for coming, everybody. And Neil and Nicole already signed a bunch of the books that are for sale. Um, I may have forgotten to mention that books are for sale, so please talk to our rep at the back. Uh, and they're going to be here for a couple minutes if you want to say hi. Thanks for having us. Thanks for having us, yeah. Thank it was you. Fun. Thanks, guys.